Kathy Heller, in case anybody's listening, um, I just want them to know we have done no prep. You came on and I said, Kathy, I don't want to miss a word of whatever the heck we talk about, even all the pleasantries and how are you and everything. So um, this is magical. We have, it's, God, I haven't talked to you in what, two weeks? I love you so much. I just am so in love with you. You're so special. Special is like, it's nowhere near the right word. I just felt, um, oh my God. And we've both been around this block and we yeah. both know really cool people. And I've gotten to have on my show, like Deepak Chopra, no big deal. And Tony Robbins and how like I was bawling my eyes out because I think when people hear truth, they can't help it. They just are brought to tears. Like it's like looking at the Grand Canyon or you look at Michelangelo's work in the Vatican and you just whisper or you cry. You were like unwrapping a Christmas present that just kept coming like to new surprises. We, we were like 45 minutes in and you were like, oh, let me tell you this. And then it was like three minutes before we got off. You're like, and let me tell you. I was like, what? what is it with you? What is happening? <laughs> the, the amount of goodness that you give is equal to like a thousand a thousand amazing souls. I'm just, I just get to be one of those people who says thank you for all your courage and generosity that you want to give that to somebody else because you do it so well. So um, I am glad you recorded that because that's all true. And uh, I haven't stopped talking about you. Everyone knows about you because I, wherever I go now, I just have to add that you and how you impacted me. You're amazing. Um, everyone's gonna have to listen to us tell each other how amazing each other are for a few minutes here. Um, no, and and that, by the way, what you just did is your gift. It's one of, I'm sure, many. But Thank the way you. that you just acknowledged me, and that's like what you did in the podcast. Um, by the way, I did want to mention you. You said something about it was like when people see Michelangelo's work, they just I get compared to Michelangelo's work a lot. So I just wanted to. No, I'm kidding. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> But, but no, like it, I can't even explain. I think me and you need to co-host a podcast or something, right? Like, or at least an event, right? Something like I, I, the comments from people, cause like you felt something really special during our conversation. I felt it. I'm like, we're like, what is happening here? And then when people listen to it, the comments, like one person said it was listening to our conversation was an out of body experience for them. We're like, um, we really didn't want to do that. I hope you're back in your body. I hope so. And somebody else was like, this is the best interview I've ever seen. Like, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, and I, I just, I went, to, I talked ahead. to my wife like five minutes ago. I said, Hey, I'm about to interview Kathy Heller. Do you know who that is? She's like, yeah, that woman you've been talking about for the last <laughs> couple of weeks that you, that she interviewed you or whatever. And I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know yeah, her. Uh, we need to get our families together. That would be so much fun. Where do you live? I forgot. I live in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. Are you going to okay. get, are you going to escape? No, I'm sorry. That's a whole other topic. Well, that <laughs> needs to be recorded yeah. on another platform. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we should get our families together. And I think part of what you and I do is like, we're both super vulnerable. Like we both have really big open hearts and we probably weren't trying to be the most popular kid in high school. We were just a really kind person. And genuinely seem to care and i think people can tell and like oh my god and then you met each other how neat yeah. so i just you're so lovable and um so freaking smart i wake up now i was always an early riser and i had some kind of a morning practice but since you i wake up i've been going to bed at 9 30 because of you so i could wake up at 5 a.m nice. i just want to be i want to be in that energy so thank you for that yeah, you're welcome. Um, what were we even gonna talk? I had some questions I wrote down. Starting a business, yeah. side hustles, finding yeah. your purpose. Well, let's start. Let's start with this. So you're one of the top podcasters uh, in the history of humanity. I like to say it in a way that's like you know, I could say on iTunes or whatever, but like in the history of humanity, since the beginning of time, <laughs> you have emerged as one of the top podcasters in the history of the world. So. Starting there, um, what what's made your podcast and your message resonate so much? What you know, how have you built such an engaged audience? Like, let's let's start there. Um, thank you so much for saying that. I yeah, that is such a cool way to say it. Uh, I think that we can all be Wi-Fi routers for each other. Okay. You know, I think when somebody can see further than you're seeing 
and they actually see it. They see it so clearly that you start to reach for a higher branch. Mm. And I think with me, I was just always able to say to people, can I show you a mirror of who you really are? Like whether yeah. you are my Uber driver or my waiter or yeah. my best friend, I'm like, you're amazing. You know, my best friend, she started a business making vegan corned beef because she had become vegan. Okay. And I said, this is insane. You have to do something with this. And she wound up going on Shark Tank. Now her business has just been whatever qualified quantified it's 75 million dollar evaluation this oh is my god two and a half years in but i do this with everyone and my husband's always like it's a little bit dangerous like you're so influential you encourage people so much and then what if they don't follow through i'm like no because god's got you like if you this universe right the way that I, i'm going to use the word god and people don't like that word use any word you like i just think that there is something so obvious going on in this world that is loving you into life right and it's not neutral it's net positive so you can like bend reality like if you take a step forward the rewards are disproportionate. We all know that, right? I had Bob Goff on my show and he was like, if you woke up every day, made a list of five ways you could contribute and you were just focused on being generous in the world. Oh my gosh, you know how to make banana bread. You're going to make a loaf for your family and leave a, leave a loaf at somebody's door. You know what opportunities? Next thing you know, you're going to have 15 businesses. You're going to be helping somebody else with a thing. You're going to be on the board of this event that raises money. Like we don't get the juice out of our generous hearts, our creative selves, because we're constantly, honestly, self, self involved. And what's interesting is the ego, we all have one. It doesn't really want to think about our itself. And that's what makes us depressed. Like when you're home, the reason you're sad is because you were made for others. You were made to serve. You were made to give, you were made to collaborate. So when you're sitting on your couch all day watching Netflix and feeling like, why don't I feel better? Why do I need to add something else to cart to feel better? It's because you have so much to give and what keeps you up at night, it's not because your marriage is failing. It's not because of this. It's because you have this potential that you are sitting on and it's killing you because your soul yeah. is like, I came here to do some stuff. Yeah. I don't know what those things are. So one thing I like to talk to people about on my podcast is how you can even start to identify what some of your gifts might be. And then the reason I like to teach people how to start a business is because it keeps you accountable to doing the stuff, mm. right? Like if you say, I'm going to start a hobby, you might not follow through. But if you yeah. just sold somebody a cheesecake and they needed three cheesecakes for a birthday party by Sunday, you will get them done. And what Seth Godin taught me, who's my mentor he said, Kathy, business is radical empathy. Business is if somebody's going to take money that they earned and give it to you because they need or want the service or the product or the thing you're doing, you have to care about that person. Mm. And if your business fails, it's because there's a lack of empathy. You're not looking at feedback. You're not looking at reviews. You're not listening to what they're saying. So I think starting a business is really a secret way for you to have the best personal development journey of your life. It mm. also gets you out of yourself. It helps you tell a story. So I think that's probably why the podcast resonated because I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about this. And, you know, the Talmud says words from the heart, enter the heart. Mm. And I think when somebody is being honest, even if they're just telling you about Bruce Springsteen and how much they love him and what they saw on this tour, they went on, they saw eight ship you'll all of a sudden be compelled to like go follow Bruce Springsteen because they're so in their resonance when they talk about it. And so you and I do that, right? No one had to tell you to care about the things you're saying. You picked a topic of the things that you care about. So with podcasting, and we could talk about that too, how to grow a podcast, that's, that's numero uno. Yeah. Yeah, so what I see... Um, as I'm listening here and see, as I'm listening to you talk, um, and, and I resonate like a lot of so hand much. gestures. What'd you say? It's a lot of hand gestures. I'm like, what is he going to say? He sees uh, a lot of this. Um, uh, yeah. You, uh, well, cause I feel like, um, I'm looking in a mirror in some ways and, and like hearing you talk. And then it makes me think even like go inside and be like, oh, I relate to how that showed up for me. So, um, here's what I think has made you resonate. It's authenticity, 
and vulnerability, which are kind of like two sides of the same coin, right? When you're vulnerable, there's a great, great quote from Robin Sharma that I, that I love, that I live by. He said, when you're vulnerable, people fall in love with you. Mm-hmm. Right? Sweet. So and we're, true. we're always trying to be the opposite of vulnerable. We're trying to protect our vulnerabilities cool. yeah. right? and be cool and impressive, you know, and nobody gives a shit about you being impressive. They just want to know who you are that you care, how you can help them, right? Yeah. Um, so that's the first thing is you're you're authentic and vulnerable. Um, the second thing is that you care about other people. You genuinely care about other people. And the third thing is that you are a lighthouse in terms of your enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. So like when I was in sales and people would ask me like, how did you sell so much Cutco? I go, I, like, I, I had no sales skills. I just had enthusiasm. And, and, you know, and I once heard that definition of selling is a transfer of enthusiasm from one person to another, right? And you just mentioned it. Like, if you're like, Bruce Springsteen's the greatest person ever. I saw the concert, and right? And, and you're like, I don't even like Bruce Springsteen. But by the end of that person's story, you're like, no, he's fine, dude, but yeah. I've got to go Google Bruce Springsteen and like watch some YouTube videos and download some songs, right? So, so that's it. So it's authenticity, it's care, and it's enthusiasm. And if you're listening, right, check in with yourself. Are you authentic, right? Do you just put yourself out there without reservation, without worrying so much what other people are going to think, right? Like when we're out and about, my kids, my wife, they're like, Hal, you're talking so loud. Like you're talking, you know, like you too, yeah. <laughs> like, so I'm like, good. Oh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, I'm always coming from a place of love. Yeah. So if somebody overhears that, awesome. I don't, you right? like, you know, and if somebody's bothered, like, oh, I don't know. I'm sorry, but. Um, Thank you so much. It means so much to uh, me coming from you because you, you hold the award for like, so cool in my book. You know, oh. you're just such a person of integrity. So all of those things mean so much to me. And it reminds me, my friend, Lauren, she went to Stanford and then stayed up there and worked with people who were going to do TED Talks to coach them on like how to do a good TED Talk. And she showed me this one clip and it's from the debates with Clinton, Bill Clinton mm-hmm. and George Bush Sr. And she shows this one point in this debate, this town hall debate. And by the way, I never talk politics. I'm the most apolitical person. If Me anything, too. I am, I'm purple. I'm not red <laughs> or blue. Yeah, I am yeah. like issue by issue. So this is not about politics, yeah. but she showed me this clip where Bill Clinton walks into the audience and he says, to this woman, can I put my hand? Do you mind if I put my hand on your shoulder? And she says, okay. And he goes, I get it. I'm a kid from Arkansas. And Lauren said he won the debate in that moment. Like they yeah. showed the ratings and what happened. And it's not about having the information or the right answers. It's like, it's that caring, authentic, vulnerable thing. And if you think about even like American Idol, I know it's like silly, but this is something that people at home, you know, we get, we get a chance to weigh in and we always pick the vulnerable person, right? Mm. Like nobody will forget Kelly Clarkson and her voice cracking cracking yeah she's saying a moment like this and if you look at all the people who even won after that you don't really remember but we remember her because she showed vulnerability on national television like i'm just a girl from texas and like i can't help it you know like this is a moment like for my life and like they love that they don't care if she's a size zero they don't care if she doesn't have the perfect voice at that moment they feel like that's courage. So I do think that that's what it takes to be good in, in all of the things. And I think we've just gotten really bought into the ego and comparison, you know, Mm. comparing ourselves and the number of followers and it's really focusing on the wrong things. Yeah. Yeah. There's a quote that I, uh, I always, I have a bunch of quotes that I always write whenever I have a thought that I'm like, Ooh, that's, that's good. And I, you know, I put it on my website on my quotes page or whatever, but there's one that says, um, stop trying to, imp- I think stop trying to impress people. Just focus on how you can add value to their lives. Yeah. Right? Like get like, right to it. Yeah. Nobody cares about, 
you know, impressing. And I think for anybody listening, like who you are, and you, you said it earlier, like every person has so much in them. Uh, and, and I think that we, we listen to the voice of doubt. We compare ourselves to others. Right. Uh, in fact, I'd love to hear your take on that. Like how does somebody overcome those feelings of being unworthy or of imposter syndrome? Oh my gosh. I mean, it's so much along the lines of what you just said, but my very favorite answer to that, um, is somebody I already quoted. I I'm going to quote him again, Seth Godin, because mm. he's, he's like kind of taken me under his wing over the last few years. And he told me this example and he goes, let's say you, you're, you're worried about how you're going to get over imposter syndrome. He goes, imagine if you were a lifeguard and it's only your third day on the job. And the senior lifeguard tells you that he or she is going to go take a 30 minute lunch break and they'll be back. And sure enough, they're gone for 30 minutes and somebody's drowning. There's a little boy drowning. Yeah. Do you think for one second that you're going to say, uh, you know, I'm going to wait for her to get back because my cross body hold is not perfect at this point. And uh, I wasn't expecting to have to do this and I'm not sure I'm good enough. Like, hell no. Even if you're not the lifeguard, you're jumping in the water. You're showing up because it's not about you. Mm. And so often what people really want from the person who's podcasting or selling them coffee at the local coffee shop. They don't care how perfect the coffee is. They care that you were present. They care that you showed up. They care that you make eye contact. And then the other stuff figures itself out. It's like you're invested in trying to show up and do your best. And we don't, we've lost that art. Oh my gosh. I mean, my friend James Alchester says that his, he feels his whole business is a result of literally giving ideas to other people. He said he has this practice for the last 20 years where whatever he's doing, no matter what the day is, if he just listened to a podcast, if he's reading a book, could be your book, he will stop and once a day, make a list of ideas for someone else mm. and email you and say, hey, Hal, you've never met me. My name is James. Here were 10 ideas I had. First of all, your first chapter, that's so impressive. That could be a short documentary. And I have a friend who I think you could do this with. And these are the three things I thought you could have in scene one. That he literally has been give, giving ideas away because A, he said it's easier than himself because his mm. resistance doesn't come up and it helps him practice that muscle of creativity. And B, it gives him so many opportunities because people write back and say, that was like the coolest email. Yeah. And do you want to work on that with me? And he's like, now at this point, he's like, no, I can't. I don't have any time, but we are meant to not worry about ourselves. It's very, what I learned is, and I told this to my husband because my husband is not a lifeguard. He's a <laughs> comedian. He's a comedian and he's really good and he's really funny. And he went through a lot of pain as a kid and his dad died suddenly in 1987. And so to make his mom happier, he learned to be funny. And he's really funny. It was a way that they got through a lot of hard times. So eventually I said to him, well, what's this really about? You're not, you're not doing stand up, right? You're not going to go to the club. You're not going to get up. Is that about you or everybody else? I think it's egocentric. Mm. I, I said to him, your humility, what you think is humility is ego. Yeah. Because if this was about someone else, you would say, so I might not have the best perfect like voice or tone or setup, but I'm going to go out there. And even if I make six people laugh tonight, I'm going to make it about them. And sure enough, when you even have that energy and you're not holding on to what do they think of me? How am I doing? It's already good. It's already funny. It's already better. Yeah. So I think the, I not, I'm not good enough. Imposter syndrome is egotistical. And I think mm. anyone who's listening, especially to your show, that's not your value. You want to be altruistic. So yeah. get busy and make things that you iterate on. Like, let's get over that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and James is the perfect example of authenticity, like, and non-perfection. He really he's so awkward. Like, I love, like, James and I, James. He's quirky. That's his he's thing. He's quirky. He's so unique and different, right? But But in terms of, like, if you were comparing how he communicates with like a speech coach, right? He Not would, at he would, all. He'd fail no. all the tests, you know what Fail I mean? everything. Like, but everybody yeah. loves him. He's just, he's because he's himself. And if you're listening to this, amplify who you are. And Kathy, something that you said, I, I, or really the theme of what you've been weaving through this whole, you're, you're talking so far is 
selflessness. You, you said altruistic, right? I think that's one of the greatest lessons. And that reminds me, the, the quote is, uh, don't worry about trying to impress people. Just focus on how you can add value to yeah. their lives. And I read a book uh, called Love is the Killer App by Tim Sanders, who's the former COO of Yahoo. Never I read even it heard 2000. it. I love when somebody tells me about something amazing that I haven't yet heard. And I'm like, oh, I can't wait to get my hands on it. So I read it in 2005. And um, Love is the Killer App, meaning basically it, it, he's saying today in business, love is the most important application to be successful, right? And he says it, back in the day, it was it was power. It was this, it was that. And he said, now people have so many options, right? You know, it used to be like, if you worked for a company that was like, oh God, I need to hang on to this job for the rest of my life. And the boss could be a total ass, you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, cause you had nowhere else to go. And now it's like, uh, I'm going to go post my resume on a website that then sends it out to 150 companies. So, right. So it's like, he talks about that, that love is the advantage that you have. If you can come from a place of love, if you can express love, if you can be love, if you can love others, if you can share and from that book, I defined my purpose in life to selflessly add value to the lives of others. And that was in 2005, right? Mission and immediately I got, what'd you say? Mission accomplished. Yeah, thank you. Well, no, it, and it's true. It, and it goes back to Zig Ziglar's quote, which is, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want. Mm -hmm. um, I have another mentor who gave a speech once and he said, get off self and on purpose, right? So you look at all these themes and the, the secret to success is to get off self and to get on purpose. It's to go, okay, how can I help as many people as I possibly can? And start at home, right? Start with your family. How can I add value for my spouse, for my kids, for my friends, for my mom, for my dad, for my family? How can I add value and become a person like that's your mission in life is looking for ways to add value. When James sends a list of 20 ideas, all he's doing is how can I add value for this person in the form of ideas, right? Totally, yeah. Um, yeah, and, and so, yeah, when you do that, one thing that it does is it allows you to transcend your imposter syndrome and, and your insecurity because you said something a few minutes ago, which became my mantra that year, the year that I defined my purpose to selflessly add value my mantra became, it's not about me. Whenever I was like, I don't feel like doing this. I was like, whoa, whoa, it's not about me. No, nope. I'm nope. too tired to do this. Whoa, it's not about me, right? I'm afraid I'm not good enough. Whoa, it get this, it's not about me, yeah. right? And the thing about it, I, I know it's, it's a little bit funny, maybe not to everybody, but I had Dr. Phil on my podcast and I was like, what's this gonna be like? Is uh, he gonna be like, he was great. And one of the things he said was, when you do that, you receive it. So yeah. he's like, if you're feeling lonely and you know that there's an elderly woman who lives next door and mm. you decide to help her feel less lonely, that's when you, you feel whatever it is that you're missing. When you give it away, you receive it. And I think we get that, you know, I had Alicia Silverstone on a couple of weeks ago and I asked her what was like the turning point in her life that brought her some sense of like peace. And she said, this is going to sound maybe weird, but <laughs> breastfeeding my son, mm. because in that moment, I knew exactly what I was supposed to do. And there was nowhere else to go. And as much as he wanted to nurse, I wanted to give this. I, I physically was uncomfortable unless I gave it. And as soon as I gave it, I felt back what I gave. So I think we, we, you know, Marianne Williamson said to me that if you looked at the ocean, you would be crazy and you would never think that one wave is separate from another because you can see that there's no place where they split. Mm. And if you looked at the ocean, you wouldn't think the waves were separate from the ocean themselves because they're so obviously one and the same. And that's us, you know, like Einstein, I was just reading more and more about what he had to say. And he said, we see the world in 3D cubes because our eyeball perceives things with height, depth, and width. But he said, there's not three dimensions, there's 10. There's mm. 10 dimensions to the universe, right? Time is the fourth dimension, but that's elastic. The fifth dimension is beyond space and time. But then there's like aspects of the universe that just go bigger and bigger. So from God's perspective, there's this one long present moment and there's just this oneness, this oneness, this oneness. And so I think for me, part of what really 
just turned all the lights on was after college, I took a two week trip to Jerusalem um, and I stayed for three years. And so before I came to Los Angeles in 2003, I was there, I was learning, I was absorbing. And, and so when I came to LA, I had this notion that we are each a masterpiece, a piece of the master. We are someone, some of the one, right? Like, so yeah. of course you want to give because you want to be clear about who you are, right? I had Deepak Chopra on and he talked about how it's very sad, but the number two cause of death in people under the age of 18, which are considered children, 17 mm. and younger, the number two cause of death is suicide. And he said, that means we have failed as a society mm. to teach people who they are because they're so caught in the story of the ego versus the, the, I am the truth of who you are, the soul, the consciousness, the part that you're not separate from anything else. You're a part, you're needed. You're part of this whole beautiful geometric pattern. And so every person, including you that I've had on my podcast now, 650 people, they all meditate, they all pray, they all find their way to the frequency that's bigger than what your eyes see. You know, I was listening to The Greatest Showman the other day and that song, A Million Dreams, she says, I close my eyes and I can see. Mm. Like we see further with our eyes closed, right? When you wish on a candle, when you pray, all those things, you close your eyes and then you see. Yeah. So when we're looking with our eyes, we often see our egos, we see each other's egos, we compare our egos to each other, we try to be impressive. But when you close your eyes and you feel into your heart, you feel into the space, you're like, how many people could I love? An endless amount, right? And how much creativity could I allow through? Endless. And how many, how much is there? How much room is there for all of us? Endless. So we've just gotten so off track. We're so bought into what is, it's temporary, it's fleeting. Deepak said to me, oh, you're not, you're not your soul, you're your body. Great. Which one? Your body at six months old, yeah. your body at 14. Because all of that was changing, right? The only yep. thing that's true is that which doesn't change. Your essential self, when you were conceived, that moment, that life force, that that spark of electricity, that yeah. moment, that's you. Yeah, that hasn't changed. That's never changing. You were, right. you know, you how I could I could picture meeting you when you were seven years old, and me being like, this kid is so sweet. Like <laughs> he might be goofy. I'm just kidding, but like. <laughs> He's so sweet. And like, that was me. Like I was the girl in fifth grade at Ashley Crone's house, if she's listening. And I said to her, I can't believe you invited me to your party. Cause she was like the blonde hair, blue eyed cheerleader. She never invited me again. But like, who says that out loud? Like yeah. I've always been this person and that's the unchanging. And that's not about what I look like or how tall I am or what I'm eating or who I'm friends with. Cause all of that has changed. My lunchbox is different. What I watch on TV is different. My, I, you know, I, I'm taller. Yeah. But I'm not different because that's yeah. my soul. That's yeah. the essential self. Yeah. I, 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 I'm with you. Michael Singer calls it the seat of consciousness, right? And uh, I have you read his book, new book, Living Untethered? It's amazing. It's so good. It's so good. So good. Right. But he talks about that. And, and he's not the only one. I'm, you know, I mean, many, right? Truth is truth. Right. But he says that if you ask someone who they are, right, they usually answer with their name. It's like, well, no, those are just some words that your parents assigned you at birth. You're like, oh, yeah, that's true. Right. But we like we really identify like, yes, I am this person. And then and then you you'd go, no, who are you? And you go, oh, I, I'm you know, I'm a 43 year old man. Right. And it's like, but wait, yeah. When you were looking in the mirror at 10, wasn't it the same you looking, even though your body, right. You're like, Thank Oh you. yeah. Right. So it's, it, it's true to, and to, to live from that place. I did a whole podcast episode after I read that book. Like I talked about this concept of, of like, who are we, we are consciousness. And, and I like to think of it. You use an analogy about the ocean. I think about, I like to think that each of us were a droplet of water in the ocean of God. That's it. Right. It's all God. It's made, one big video game called God. <laughs> same stuff made of the same stuff, you know? Um, and if that's even a little bit true, then, then for you to think that you are not worthy of infinitely anything and everything that you want for your life, 
Um, so let me ask you that, that what do you think is the biggest thing that holds people back from taking steps towards the life they desire, whatever that is for them? Oh my gosh. I love that question. I mm -hmm. think it's that they believe a lie and it's one of two lies and it's either this is not possible, right? Mm -hmm. If something's not possible, why would you take a step toward it? Yeah. Not. Yep. Um, or I am not good enough at this thing. Like I'm not worthy of, of doing this thing. So I think that's what has to be changed. And I think what people like you do, I think what my podcast does is it shows us evidence that things are possible. You know, when I was growing up, we had career day. I don't even know if they do that anymore, but I remember who would come to career day, a fireman. Uh, one time it was like, so out of the box because a guy came who worked in an ad agency. And I was like, what's that? So if you're creative, the most creative thing you could ever do is that guy's thing. So we reach for the highest branch we can see. My friend, Alex Benayan told me a story about Teach for America. And this teacher for Teach for America said, to, you know, tell, tell the second graders to draw something they want to be when they grew up. And this one drew an astronaut and this one drew a whatever, a marine biologist with a dolphin. And this kid in the back of the room drew nothing. And the teacher walked over and said, you know, do you understand the assignment? You know, draw anything you want to be when you grow up. He drew a pizza delivery guy. So the teacher called the mom at the end of the day and said, I wanted to talk to you about Steven. He drew a pizza delivery boy. Do you think you have any ideas why this assignment was this? And she said, I can tell you exactly why. His father's in prison mm. and his uncle is the only other man in his life. He's a pizza delivery guy. Wow. And so why don't people take a step forward? They don't see another possibility. We limit what is possible. But when we see people who are doing things, who are able, you know, Howard Schultz was on my show. He grew up in public housing. He grew up at the last stop of the L train in Canarsie, Brooklyn. And, and Jewish family services used to bring them food. And his mother would say to him, this is the last stop of the L train, but look at me. This will not be your last stop. You promise me you don't get off here. Mm. And when I interviewed him, we both started to cry when he told me that he said, you really just heard that. So that made me cry. And I said, it does make me cry because that belief she instilled in you, Howard, you're a billionaire with a B you give people at Starbucks healthcare. Like there've been books written about people who got a part-time job at Starbucks to go through chemo because he's mm -hmm. done that for people. That's possibility making right? And how that started, which is just such a fun story because it, it, it relates to anyone's story. He worked at FedEx doing cold calling, got a job in sales for a coffee grind company, had never been out of the country. They sent him to Italy. He was at a conference. He thought to himself, I don't want to be at the conference. I've never been out of the country. I grew up a poor kid. I want to take a walk. He walked around the block, saw people sitting with tiny little espresso uh, cups, uh. talking to each other. And he said, I don't understand. These people, their coffee is, the cup is empty, but they're <laughs> lingering. In Europe, they linger. They're with each other. They make space. They don't go there for the coffee. They go for the conversation. And he said, we don't have a place like that in America. If we want to get coffee, it's a Denny's of bacon, eggs, and coffee. He said, but if I just made coffee, I wonder if people would come for the conversation. And mm. so he built the very first Starbucks with that in mind, that somebody would come just for coffee so that they'd meet with their friends, they'd have conversations. And that intention, he now has 35,000 Starbucks. Wow. <laughs> and uh, he makes billions of dollars. But the point is, when you hear a story like that, you're like, okay, if our greatest resource is our creativity, our passion, our compassion, our resourcefulness, what really is possible? So starting to feel how much more space there is, how much more expansion. I think that's number one. And then number two, I like to break it down. Like really don't make great the enemy of good. Like John Wooden said, like take a step forward. And so for instance, for anyone who's listening, if you're like, I would like to start a business, I think part of it is the steps feel so overwhelming. I'm going to tell you in two minutes how you can do it, how Howard Schultz did it, how I started a podcast, how anyone built anything. The first thing you do is you give it away for free. That's the first thing you do. So if it's peanut butter, they're doing fo focus groups all day long, right? If it's Hyundai, you come in for a free test drive. Like you don't have to stand up and sell. You give it away for free because you want the space 
to iterate. The second thing you do is you get feedback. You make your own focus group, hand somebody that vegan corned beef, hand someone your gluten-free cake pop, give someone an hour of free organizing services, and then do the feedback loop. What did you like about it? What did you not like about it? What would you change about it? What would you pay for this? That is so valuable. Do that a few times. Now you have enough data. You can say they want the organizing services to be streamlined. I'm going to start with people's offices or they want the gluten-free cake pops to have more cinnamon. Great note. I'm going to add the cinnamon. Now you go back with the improved version and you see, do they like it? And if the answer is yes, now you sell it. Now you if you sell. sell that to one person, and this is what people don't understand, one satisfied customer, that's your tipping point. Yep. That's it. From there, you scale it. So when people say, I don't know how to get started, what they're really saying is I'm overwhelmed. But mm -hmm. when you break it down, it's not overwhelming. It just takes the courage to be willing to be messy. And the problem for most people is I don't want to give myself the time and space to be messy because I feel shame mm. unless I know that even for this neighbor of mine with trying my gluten-free cake pop, I'm nervous to fail. If you go back and look at kids in preschool classes, they're okay being messy. They've got paint in their nose. Yeah, We were all like that at one point. And yeah. come second grade or turning 19, somebody was somebody rejected us. Somebody was harsh. You learned not to do anything unless you knew from the outset exactly how it would go and exact, but nobody's built anything like that. And so in order for you to build anything that's worthwhile, you need the courage to put yourself out there, care about people and give yourself that time to iterate. You, you iterate by episode nine of your podcast. You will find your voice. You'll get feedback from people. You'll reshape the show. Every, everyone like Fred Astaire also look, look yeah. under his tap shoes, his feet have been banged up. He tried it a few times, yeah. right? So if you give yourself that grace, you could do a lot of good things. I, yeah. I think that, you know, you mentioned people not wanting to, it to be messy. I think that we have this idea that it needs to be perfect. And also when we look at other people who are very successful um, and we only see their perfect success, they come across as perfect. And then we create this separation and go, oh, I'm not like them. I'm not as polished. I'm not as well-spoken. I don't have their charisma. I don't have their talent. I don't have their experience. Huh, I'm just gonna keep doing what I'm doing, right? Versus you see how messy their road to success was, how many failures, how many auditions they were kicked out of, how many businesses failed before the one succeeded, how many, you know, um, I think yeah. I just was in England a couple of days ago. I spoke uh, at Arbon, and there was, you know, before I spoke, it was like the second or third day of the event and all these, you know, top, per I was the only outside speaker. So everybody else on stage and I was in the audience watching, I always like to get an idea of what's going on. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, these people are on a pedestal and right, this person's got this business and this person got this business. And that was like my opening when I went out there, I just said, Hey, I said, you know, this morning you heard from Andrea and Ian and Alice and Kelly. Holy shit. I can't really remember those names. Um, I, <laughs> I said, was like, are those real? I those are the real sure names. Those were yeah. not real. Yeah. Those are the real names. And so that was who spoke that morning at before I did. And I said, um, I, uh, I said it, very likely that you put them on a pedestal and you think, oh, if only I was like them, I want you to understand they were once born, they were a baby and they had never sold Arbon in their life. Right. And then they took their first step and then that, you know, on and on. And so the point is anything another human being has done is evidence of what's possible for you. Right. Oh, I'll, I'll say that again, internalize that if you're listening, right. Anything another human being has done is possible for you. It's evidence of what you can do because they're just a human that has their own fears and insecurities and imposter syndrome. I mean, I still have it like in high school. I I still feel like I'm just like, I have the same issues that I had in high school. Right. But now it's with like people in my industry. Right. So I'm like, Oh, this person who's like also an author, like I, who am I? And then I like, I'll, I'll meet him. They're like, Oh, you're like Kamal Ravikanti. You know, love is the right. Yeah. Um, love yourself. Like your life depends on it. I was actually, I was on, uh, doing a tour, uh, promoting the miracle equation, my book. 
And James, speaking of James Altucher, um, he was the last stop on my tour. I went out to New York and I went into his studio. And uh, this is a fun story. I haven't told this much, but um, so I'm a huge fan of Kamal Ravikant. If you don't know that his book, Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It, one of my favorites, right? So I walk into James's studio and his studio is in, in a comedy club that he performs at, I right? And, uh, and I walk in and I see this guy and I think that he's James's producer. I just assume he's James's producer. And, uh, and, and I, I walk up and he's like, Hal Elrod. And I said, yeah, he goes, your book changed my life. I'm a huge fan of the miracle morning. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, thank you. That means so, you know, I, like, I thank you. That means a lot to me. Like every time I hear that, I, I always try to hear it with fresh ears. Like I've never heard it before. I really want to receive this one human being has been impacted. I go, thank you so much. I go. So I said, I said, so you work with James and he said, Oh no, no, no. I'm just visiting We're I'm a friend. I said, oh, I said, what, what, I said something like, what do you do or something, right? And he's like, oh, I'm an author. I go, oh, what did you write, you know? And, uh, and he goes, uh, well, the, the book I'm best known for is Love Yourself Like Your Life Depends On It. And no, I-, I just, bec- I go from thinking I'm talking to James's producer, right? And really appreciating what he's telling me to just being like, and then now I'm like starstruck. And I'm like, wait a minute, you're, and I, it was funny. I remember I literally like, collapsed on the I fell forward into what? a hug I fell forward into a hug I go and I hugged him and I I my you know my lips were like two inches from his ear I'm like your book changed my life <laughs> that is an amazing right? story and yeah. and part of it is you know we were talking about you said before if you're listening absorb this if somebody else has done mm. this that's evidence and it's interesting this woman came to one of my live events and she raised her hand and she asked me you know, what would it, what would it take for her to feel like more in the zone, right? She's like, I've done meditations in the morning and I've done this and I've done that. And I I seem to, to not be able to find this feeling of feeling good all the time. I I Mm. kind of, you know, I said, well, what would you love it to be? She's like, even if 60% of the time I felt lit up, I'd be, I'd be so happy with that. And I said, Whoa, hang on a second. So can you imagine you're talking to a doctor? (laughs) And you said, I don't mind being nauseous 40% of the time, or, you know what? I might have a blaring headache 40% of the time, but could you help me feel physically great 60% of the time? No way would you do that. You wouldn't be satisfied. You, we all know this, right? If for some reason something's like itchy or you have a back pain and it lasts a little while, you're concerned. You're like, I don't expect to feel physically bad at all. My yeah. stomach hurt last night. It hurt two days ago. I don't like that. I'm going to yeah. watch. I'm going to look at it. Okay. What I'm saying when I say, you said, what's the greatest thing holding people back? I said, I don't think it's possible. You don't think it's possible to feel good all the time. And you don't think it's possible to be successful. And you don't think it's possible to do something you love and get paid for it. But it's interesting that you do believe it's possible to feel physically good all the time. And you're upset if it's anything but a hundred percent, which you Mm. should be. Mm. It's the paradigm. If you shifted your paradigm and said, I don't want anything less. This is my one life in this incarnation with this body, with this car. And I want to feel awesome every day. Guess what? Every palm tree was designed to feel good all day. Every dolphin was designed to have the best day every day. And so was every person. We don't believe that's true. So what we do is we allow so many awful thoughts to swirl, Mm. which kicks on our cortisol, which makes Mm. us feel awful, which gets us out of momentum, which gets us out of being creative. And we go, that's fine. That's just called being a grown up. That's just called adulting. No, it's not. Yeah. There are people like Hal and myself who made a decision and Mm. Hal's was coming from a giant place of life or death seeing those possibilities and saying, if I'm going to be here, God, and you're going to let me be here, I'm going to love this thing. Yeah. I'm going to appreciate it. Yeah. But we know people who don't have that level of stakes, who still made a decision. Some of them do the miracle morning. Some of them do their version of miracle morning, but they do that morning thing. And they don't want to wait to feel good. They don't want to leave it to chance. They don't want their day to be hijacked. They say, this is my day. Every moment is as good as it gets. Yep. Right yep. now, I could look outside and I could notice the 116 shades of green. Mm. 
I would feel wholeness. I would feel freedom. It's where you turn your attention. So the first problem is you don't even think it's possible. You've been so conditioned by your Instagram feed and all the negativity on, on TV that you're like, nobody's actually enjoying this thing called life. That sucks. And that's not really the way it was designed. Mm. So <clears throat> I think the more we have these conversations, people start feeling into, hang on a minute. Maybe I should stop beating the drum of all the evidence why life isn't really designed for me. How could I reapproach this gorgeous gift called my life? And uh -huh. what would actually make it feel exciting? And I think to go back to where we started in a sense, I think our greatest need is to feel like we contributed to someone else's life. I think mm -hmm. we all came here with an assignment to make the world more whole. And I think it's interesting actually that we value things that are rare, like gold and diamonds, but there's nothing more rare than a human being. Like, cause you have a different fingerprint. And if you think of evolution, things get, we don't have webbing between our feet anymore. Like there is no scientific reason that everyone would have a different fingerprint, unless it's a wink from God mm. that you make a different imprint and that will be missing without you. You're needed. You're needed. People don't recognize how when you tell a story, you're speaking to someone who, who needed to hear that story to feel less alone. And so even if it, you think it's like a small thing, it's a giant thing. You know, I have a friend who has interviewed 2000 people who had near-death experiences and she, and I know you, you had that. And she said that everybody had the same timeline, the same, the same, same events, even with people who like these people had a translator because they lived in China. These people lived in Brazil. It didn't matter where they lived. It didn't matter their, their religion. And she said, everybody, if they were gone a certain amount of time, there was some, it always was different how it happened, but some sort of like replay of some moments or something from their life which was insane that that was like part of what she like saw. And she said, it's these insignificant things, things that you don't even think like mattered. One person told her it was a woman. She said she hit her head on a diving board. She died. And she told everybody that she had this memory of something that happened where she was running late for a meeting and she was in a mall. She stopped there to get a black tank top because she realized that her other tank top, she had spilled something on it. And in the mall was a four-year-old kid crying. He couldn't find his mother. And she was late for the meeting and she decided to stop and help him find his mom. She totally forgot about it. Mm. 20 years later, she hits her out on a diving board. She wakes up thinking about this kid. Uh. She realized, oh my God, that like had major significance. Like that one act. Yeah. I think we are here to do those things all day, every day. Yeah. And there's no end to how much creativity and really... The fun part is like, there's no end to how much abundance we could generate abundance in learning, creativity, wealth, charity, like you get to become a conduit for all of that. You become a lightning rod, a radio for as much love, a much create, as much creativity, as much money to flow through you. And what could you do with it? How much more resource could you be a custodian of? It's just exciting. Yeah. Well, I like that. That's what you do, right? The, the podcast, don't keep your day job, the book. Don't keep your day job. Um, by the way, which came first, the podcast or the book? The podcast. And then the podcast. Uh, I got a book deal after that. And my new book doesn't come out till next August. You, you know how they do that? You turn it in. They're like, see you in a year. Yeah, yeah like, totally. What? Totally. Yeah, it's, it's a long drawn out process. Um, but what I love about that is, is it, when I'm putting together all the pieces and talking to you, it's like you've found purpose, <clears throat> excuse me, purpose in helping people find work that they love, right? Yeah you know, quit their job. They hate their day job. Um, and, 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 and find a sense of purpose by contributing to other people. And so, um, it's fantastic. What, uh, Oh, we got a few more minutes left. What, what, what are, what, what else, anything else that you feel compelled? Yeah. I mean, one thing that's fun. I do think people, this is, people find this helpful. I looked at the people that I interviewed and when I wrote the book, I said, could I put something together that would be helpful for people. And I realized I could put all these people into five categories of passions 
of assignments because I do think the opposite of depression isn't happiness, but purpose. Mm. And so the reason I like to teach people how to create a business is because it keeps them in their purpose all the time. Because if you get paid to do work that you love, mm. it's not a job, it's like no. your work, then you just keep getting to do what you love all the time. So there are five things you can do. You can either make something, like you make donuts or you write music. You can teach something. You can teach someone how to take pictures. You can teach someone how to make donuts. You can teach someone how to write music. You can curate something. You could say, I don't want to take the pictures and I don't want to teach someone how to take pictures, but I want to curate an evening of women photographers. Curate it, right? Bring, bringing people together. You can investigate things. You could get paid nowadays to go and be curious. Like Gretchen Rubin is curious about happiness and Malcolm Gladwell is curious about a lot of different things that happen in society. People think he's a psychologist. He's just a curious guy pulling mm. together research, right? Right. So you could create podcasts, blogs, events, right? So you can make something, teach something. You can also, you can do a service for somebody. Like you could say, I really am good at organizing. I really am good at putting up events and parties. When you start to think of that, you start asking yourself like, hmm, which one of those feels like what I might want to lean into. And then what I like to say is just start because it's not really important. Your self is going to keep finding you the most aligned thing anyway. And a good story, example of this, this guy, Greg Franklin reached out to me, he was listening to the podcast. He's 48, three kids, he lived in Missouri. And he wrote in and said like, I never even thought about happiness. I just thought about getting a job and healthcare. So he worked at a factory that made dog food. And his job for eight years was standing in front of a machine that made plastic bags for dog food. I said to him, this is a movie. Like this should be a movie because this is, I can see John C. Riley playing this part. Like this is insane. It's so, I couldn't make this up. So we're conversing through the podcast. He's DMing me, I'm DMing him back. He starts one day, he says, I decided to just pick something. So I saw an ad for a cheesecake recipe. So I made a cheesecake. He tells me, it, it was burnt because I didn't have a cheesecloth. And I realized, no, that actually is something you need. He said the next day he made two cheesecakes with the cheesecloth and it was good. But the second one, his family with his three kids, they didn't want to eat another cheesecake. So his wife said, why don't you bring it down to the fire station? Little town in Missouri. Brings it to the fire station. They liked it. They call him a week later. Hey, one of our sergeants is having a birthday. Could you make 12 of those? He almost says no. And then he says, Yes, I'll figure it out. I'll make you 12. So he makes 12 and then he decides to get a freezer bag and go into town to the post office, to the hair salon and just say to people, I have cheesecakes, they're $5. Some people looked at him with like a side eye. Some people yeah. said, okay, that's cute. I'll buy your cheesecake. What happens? He gets fired from the factory job and you won't believe this, but it's recorded. We did hmm. a podcast with him. He says he's on his way home. He calls his wife. He says, you're going to kill me. I lost my job, which means that we don't have health insurance. I'm going to find another factory job. And she says, no, you won't because you won't believe it. Do you know what Google told me? Today is National Cheesecake Day. And that means that you got fired because your three kids need to see you happy. Mm. And you're going to do something about this. And you're going to mm. have the courage. And we're opening up a cheesecake shop. And he said, we can't afford it. And she said, we're going to do it. So they opened a 10 by 50 little shop and they made a vow that if they could make the rent, they would keep it open for three months. They opened the store and the first day they made three times the rent in day one. Wow. He wound up building a business. He wound up, his wife was able to quit her job. This was right before a pandemic where all of a sudden people were home. And the only things that made them a little extra happy was trying things like this. He created a food truck. He opened more stores and he said, it doesn't matter if it was cheesecake or anything. I wasn't a good cheesecake maker. I just wanted something that felt creative and fun mm. and mm. different. And now he's gone from cheese. Called, his shop is called the Cheesecake Ninja, but he now does cheesecakes and these big giant cookies that are like the size of like a cake. And he's just having a blast. And his three kids who are in their teenage years see a father who likes his day. Yeah. So I say to you, there's definitely something available. If you're saying at the end of the day, 
I think there's more passion in me and I'm not feeling it. Look again, try something, iterate, because you'd be surprised when you start to ask a better question and just start to get into messy action, your whole life will change. Yeah. And, and you figure it out along the way. He didn't know how he, it doesn't, right. He works in a factory. It doesn't sound like he didn't know how to start a business. He didn't know how to grow a business. He didn't know how to run a business, right? But Nothing. he figured it out along the way. And you have to take that first step and lean, lean into it. Um, Kathy, you're, you're, you're lovely. Thanks. You're amazing. This is so much fun. Everybody listening. The podcast is don't keep your day job. Uh, the book is don't keep your day job. Kathy Heller is her name. She is in front of me. She's my guest. Um, yeah, Kathy, we definitely have to do more together. Uh, I love and appreciate you. And it was just love at first sight. Like I, you know, I just, I was like, and I literally, I think I told you and I was like, Oh, this might be too forward, but I was telling you after we recorded or text, I'm like, I fell in love with you. Like, I love you. So, um, it's, uh, it's meant to be that we connect. You are love. That's the thing. It's like, you know, that, I think that's the last thing I want to say too, is because people are like, sometimes, you know, I want to make a lot of money or I want a better relationship. And it's like, we, Wayne Dyer, I think said like, we don't get what we want. We get what we are. Mm, yes. And I used to be a musician full time. And I used to write music for shows like Grey's Anatomy and Pretty Little Liars. And for 10 years I wrote songs. And I can tell you that if you took two guitars and you put them on a table next to each other and you pluck the C string on this guitar, the C string on the other guitar vibrates mm. because there's something called resonance. Like mm. we get back what we put out. Totally. And so when you're like, I love you, it's like, you're a magnet for love. You are love. So as soon as somebody is willing to receive it and has an open heart, you love each other. It's like- yeah. How many people in your life do you know who've been on dating apps and done all the things and they look great and their body's amazing and they work out and they just can't seem to find it. And then there's other people who walk down the street and everyone's like, who is that girl? Oh my God. It's like, she's in wholeness, right? She's yeah. in resonance. She gets it back. And it's the same thing with abundance. Like when you start to appreciate the 16 shades of green on the tree outside your window and you see the abundance in your kids and in your life and in the people and in the spices and inside of you, how endless your soul goes, how much bigger it is. You can't help it. You become a match for that on every level. So I totally get it. I loved you the second I <laughs> was in your orbit. And um, I so appreciate getting to have this conversation. Thank you so much for having me on. It was yeah. so much fun. Yeah, we'll definitely be doing this again. Uh, goal achievers and members of the Miracle Morning community, you know I love you. I tell you every week. Uh, I mean it very much. I love you. I hope you're well. And uh, I will talk to you next week.